All right, so uh, <clears throat> unlike uh, other times that I've spoken from the Old Testament, today I thought maybe I can speak from the New Testament. And uh, I've been recently meditating on this particular passage um, and also sharing it with some people on the internet. So uh, I thought maybe it's something good for us also all to hear and to uh, be blessed. So please turn with me to Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. Usually it's a Christmas narrative. When you uh, get to the Christmas season, a lot of people talk about the stories as explained to us by Matthew and Mark, uh, sorry, Matthew and Luke. And... Uh, uh, it's beautiful stories there, stories about uh, the birth of Jesus, uh, the announcement of the angel to Mary, and uh, all, all the other incidents that happened um, surrounding the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. However, this afternoon, I want to talk about something a little bit different from a different angle. So, in the Gospel of Luke, uh, by the way, Gospel of Luke is the earliest connection from the Old Testament to the New Testament. In other words, the, New, the Old Testament ends with uh, the, uh, well, in our Bible is the book of Malachi, but in reality, the Old Testament ends with Nehemiah. As the walls are built, God goes into silence for 400 years. There's no more talking. God doesn't say anything. And then all of a sudden, we come to Gospel of Luke. So Luke actually is the first sign and the first incident after 400 years that God begins to speak. Unlike what we read in Matthew that Joseph found Mary to be pregnant, uh, that's after the incident of Luke chapter 1. So the Luke chapter 1 is the first incident ever in the New Testament, which is the story in chapter 1. So here we have an interesting story. Uh, I read from verse 5, chapter 1 of Luke, verse 5. It says, In the days of Herod the king of Judea, there was a certain priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, who had a wife and had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blameless in all the commandments and the requirements of the Lord. And they had no child, because El Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. Now it came about while he was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division, according to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And a whole multitude of people were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense offering. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing in the, unto the right of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him and feared gripped him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your petition has been heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you will give him the name John. And he will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. And he will turn back many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God. And it is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the, in, in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the um, attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah said to the, to the angel, how shall I know this for certain? For I am old and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and I have sent to you, I have been sent to you to speak to you to bring you this good news. And behold, 
you shall be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place because you did not believe in, in my words, which shall be fulfilled in their proper time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah and were wondering at his delay in the temple. But when he came out, he was unable to speak to them and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple and kept making signs to them and re remained mute. And it came about when the days of his priestly service were ended, that when he went back home and after those, these days, Elizabeth, his wife became pregnant and she kept herself in seclusion for five months saying, this is the way the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked with favor upon me to take away my disgrace among men. Well, nice story, a very interesting incident in our Bibles. As I said, this was the very first incident after the 400 years of silence. It's interesting that God begins the New Testament with two pregnancies, back to back, and two very unusual pregnancies. None of these pregnancies were usual. Here we have an example of a lady that is old and also barren. In other words, she cannot conceive. Even at her young age, she had probably tried to get pregnant and she wasn't getting pregnant. And then time took its toll, they grew old, and both herself and her husband, and therefore um, they were not able to have a child. So that's one incident of the pregnancy. An old lady who could not even have a child while she was young gets pregnant. And the other one is a young girl who's a virgin. She's never been with a man, she's never married, and she also gets pregnant. So within a span of six months, two women get pregnant by the same spirit, by the announcement of the same angel, and the history of the New Testament is opened up with two pregnancies, very, very unusual. And that must tell us, tell us, tells us something. That should tell us something. And the, the, the moral of the story is God does things which are not typical. God doesn't do things that are typical. If God did everything typical according to our expectation and the way we understand things, then he wouldn't be God. He would be just a very smart guy. But God does things completely out of the realm of the natural. So, having said that, I was thinking to myself, and here's what I'd like to share with you. How is it that we experience God? How is it we come to experience God? If you know of God, if you know about God, if you know something about him, but you don't have an experience with him, it's useless. You might as well pack it and put it aside and say, you know what, it's nothing that benefits me. The mere understanding and knowledge of something that exists out there, or your religion has told you that there is a God, and this God, you really don't know who he is, you really haven't known him personally, and you're maybe afraid of him, maybe you think he's an angry God, maybe you think he keeps an account of everything and he's just gonna get back at you. Maybe he is not nice God, after all, if you make a mistake, you're in deep trouble. All these thoughts may be in your head and you may think, well, you know, I'm a God-worshipping person. Well, I wouldn't be so fast by saying God-worshipping, you probably have some awareness of the fact that there is a God out there somewhere. But the Bible merely very uh, definitively reject this type of understanding. The Bible is not after increasing your head knowledge or your general theological information about the fact that there is a God. Probably out of seven billion people living in the world, probably about five billion of them know of some type of a God somewhere out there that they believe that he exists. But is it really what we see here in the scriptures as having a personal experience with God? And then I thought to myself, well, how does this happen? How do we have a spiritual experience? Is it by reading some books? Is it by even reading the Bible as merely a, a book of religion? Is it 
the fact that someone comes and tells us some information about God, is this really what is constituting an experience with God? When I looked through the Bible, I found that this is not even the way that God is interested in establishing a relationship. Well, here's the point. I think God wants to establish a relationship with every human being. He wants the relationship. You may not want it, but he wants. He does want the relationship. Because if he doesn't want the relationship, then you might as well kiss him goodbye, because that God is useless to me if he's not interested. He's got to be interested before I would also be able to step forward. You know, actually, God is interested in us before we're interested in him. He's interested in you before you even know that you should be interested in him. That's the God of the Bible. That's what the Bible says. says God is interested in you. So you can't be indifferent. Once you know that God is, in, in, God, is, God is interested in you, you can't be indifferent. You have to make a choice. Are you going to respond to his interest, or are you just going to put it aside? Well, you're free to do whatever you like. I mean, God has a free, man has a free will. You can choose however you wish. But you have to know that the Bible says God is interested in human beings. If he's not interested, then that God theologically and in any shape or form is absolutely useless. I might as well go after some ideology that I can experience it. Because if God does not want me to experience him, then what is he for? Just to scare me? Just like be a ghost out there somewhere that can come and scare the daylights out of me? No. That's not what God is in the Bible. So, how is it that we experience God? Back to that question again. How is it that we experience God? Well, I sat down and I thought about it. The way we experience God. And I discovered that there are maybe about seven steps that leads to this full experience. The first step... And if you search the Bible, I'm not going to go through all the scriptures today. I'm just going to highlight them and let you go and discover. The first step in discovering and having an experience with God is to see God in a spiritual realm. You cannot be a Christian. You cannot have a spiritual experience unless God does show himself to you. You know, you can never find God. If you search the whole world, search all the libraries in the world, everything you search, you will not find God. Unless God decides to show himself to you. And you know what? The Bible says he is interested in showing himself to you, provided you are interested. You are looking, he does show himself. If you don't search, you will not find him. And if you search the wrong way, you will not find him. The searching is an attitude, is a desire that leads to God knowing that you are looking for him. And he comes behind, from behind the curtain, he opens the curtain, says, now look at me. Now look at me. Any spiritual experience in your lifetime, in a lifetime of a human, must begin with seeing God who reveals himself to you. And I'm not talking about the physical thing. All of a sudden you see, you know, someone appear out of thin air. I'm talking about deep inside you, you come to see a reality that you had never, ever seen before. That is called a revelation. The Bible is that conduit, that instrument, that If you show interest, if you have a desire, the scripture, the word of God through the spirit of God comes and all of a sudden pulls the curtain back and you for a moment you see there is that God who is interested in you. God is there. He is interested in you. That's the first step that God must show himself to you in that spiritual dimension So many people read the Bible, but they read the Bible as a book of history or morality or religious instruction. They never figure out why this book is written. I think this book book is written only for one thing, to help you to see the curtain pulled away and God stepping into your life, 
into the dimensions of space and time to show himself to you. But once you see him in that dimension, we go now to step two. He speaks, and you have to hear what he speaks. God never shows himself and just stands there silently so you can just look at him. No, when you see the fact that he is standing there very close to you in your life, then he begins to speak. If God doesn't speak, again, the, the fact that you had a vision of seeing the fact that there is a God is useless. You do need to hear from him. God speaks. The Bible says God in the past in many diverse ways spoke through many ways and through our fathers. In these last days has spoken to us in his son. That person who is, who is called the son is the loudspeaker that when you look at him, you see God and you hear him. God needs to be able to show himself in a dimension that you can actually experience him. And that possibility of experiencing seeing God must happen in a very defined realm. And that realm is called the sun. When you look at the sun, you see God. And when you look at the sun, not only you see God, you also hear God. The sun is the environment where God shows himself and speaks. So now we have to go to another tangent here. In order to experience God, you must have an experience with the sun. Because God cannot be seen unless he shows himself. And he's chosen to show himself in a dimension called the sun and speaks in the sun. Now, the next step is once you see God, once you hear God, then you need to understand what he's saying. Without an understanding, it's just a mere noise and a mere sight, but there is no understanding. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 13 talks about the four different soils. If you read the parable of the farmer and the soils, it says he threw the seed it fell on the sideway, it threw the seed, it fell on the earth with very thin <coughs> uh, soil, and then he threw the seed, it went into a soil where there was a lot of junk there, and then finally it went into a soil that had good ground and good soil, and it grew and it had a lot of fruit. All four of these actually, not only we use them for evangelism, but in reality, it has nothing to do with evangelism because Jesus is talking about the word of the kingdom, not the word of the gospel. He talks about the word of the kingdom to explain to him, to explain to us his full mind about mankind. That's the word of the kingdom. When he, God wants to tell us everything about us and our destiny, that's the word of the kingdom. When God speaks about only our sins, the fact that the, Jesus died on the cross, that's the word of salvation, which is part and parcel of a greater vision that God has, and that is the word of the kingdom, which encompasses the entire history of man and the future that man has. You're talking about four types of believers who respond in different ways and different circumstances. But if you read the story, I'm not going to go through it, you would find that in the first three soils, they had one particular characteristics, and the fourth one was different. And the difference between the fourth one and the first three, Jesus himself explains. It's in one word. Our pastor has talked about this before. All three uh, soils, they received the word, they heard the word, but the fourth one it says they received the word, they heard the word, and they understood the word. That word understanding is added to the fourth soil. They heard and they understood. In other words, mere hearing is not sufficient. You must hear and you must understand. So you see, you hear, and then you understand. Isaiah chapter 6, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, he saw, he saw the Lord high up and on his throne. 
Well, so he had a vision. God finally pulled away. Uzziah was an obstacle. God says, Uzziah, go away. Go get aside. I want to show myself to Isaiah. Now, Isaiah is not an unbeliever. He's already prophesied for five chapters. In six, he says, Isaiah, this is not enough. I'm going to show you who I am. He unveils himself. Then he speaks to Isaiah. And Isaiah understands what God is saying. Because if you read the transaction there, you would see it. Another example, Paul on the way to Damascus. Paul the zealot, Paul the jealous, Paul the persecutor, Paul the religious. All of a sudden, just outside of the gates of Damascus, he sees a vision. Jesus pushes away the curtain and says, look at me, Paul. So he sees Jesus, and then, is Jesus silent? No. He speaks to him, says, he heard a voice. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? At that very moment, Paul began to understand that everything he had read in the Old Testament, everything that he had understood of the scriptures, was all pointing to this one man. Hearing is an essential part of having an experience with God. You want to experience God? Ask the Lord, I want to see you. I want to hear you, and I want to understand what you're saying. The fourth step is that after you understand, you need to accept what has been said. You may hear, you may understand, but you may not accept. You may say, okay, I understand, but I don't want it. Many people at this point stumble. Many people at this point stumble. They are not prepared to accept the verdict, the, the speaking, the word that God speaks. You may have had an experience. You may have seen even the Lord in your life. You may have heard his voice. You may have even understood what he's trying to say, and yet you have not decided to accept it. To accept it means you do not argue with God about what he says. You accept it. Faith becomes the tool that accepts what God is saying. And then we go to the fifth step, which is once you accept, then you need to surrender. You have to say, Lord, I understand, I accept, here I am. Isaiah, when he saw, he heard, he understood he accepted the verdict of God, and he said, God asked him a question, whom shall I send? And Isaiah said, send me, O Lord. He accepted, and he surrendered. These five steps are essential for, to bring you to a point where the Spirit of God can do something in your lives. Again, I go back for the benefit of some of our friends here. If you don't have this kind of an experience with God, your definition of God is absolutely meaningless. You cannot say anything that is based on the reality of experiencing God. You've just said something theological which everybody can say. The sixth step is once you surrender, the Spirit of God begins to work inside you to make you suitable for the object and the outcome that God has in mind. So the work of the Holy Spirit begins. You know, the Holy Spirit, we keep talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit cannot do anything unless you have gone through these five steps. You have, and the Spirit is the one that does that. The Holy Spirit brings the curtain pulls it aside so you can see the glory and the majesty of God. The Holy Spirit is the one who brings the voice of God to you. The Holy Spirit is the one that gives you understanding. The Holy Spirit is the one that asks you the question, do you accept? Now here's where the will of man comes in. 
After you've seen, after you've heard, after you've received some understanding, you do need to make that decision. Are you going to accept and are you going to surrender? And once you do that, the Holy Spirit has your permission to begin to do a very deep work in your life, to adjust you, to make you suitable, to cleanse you, to prepare you. And finally, the result of such work would be the desired end that God is after, fruit bearing, fruit bearing the blessing, the growth, the victory, everything you can decide and desire. These are the seven steps. Now, any way, anywhere along the way, if you decide that you don't want to allow any further movement, God stops. Cannot do it. It's just like when I was in university, we used to take biochemistry. That's my background. And then in every one of the physical and chemical uh, reactions, there are cycles for like for instance photosynthesis as a cycle it starts with the light on the chlorophyll uh, molecule and then it, and the end result of it it goes through a cycle of chemical changes and the the chlorophyll takes the sugar and converts it into a useful uh, energy for the plant or the krebs cycle the the uh, breakdown of uh, the needed nutrients in the mitochondria in the cell to bring it to sugar molecules so the cell can use it. The cell, cell can have energy. It used to call the Krebs cycle, and we used to have to memorize the different steps. It was so hard, all these chemical names. For us, it was kind of hard. And then we used to put poems to it so we could remember through poems these words. You know, sometimes you, you make fun so you can learn something. There's a cycle that anywhere in the cycle there is an interruption, it stops. It cannot go any further. You do need to have all the environment suitable in every one of the steps. The enzymes must be there. The chemical reactions have to be at a certain type of a condition, and it does happen. So here is to experience God. This cycle that I just described to you, it keeps repeating itself. It begins with a vision of God like photosynthesis, and it ends with the result, which is fruit. And it keeps repeating. You can't just say, I saw God once, and that's good enough. I had a vision of God. I heard God once, and that's good enough. It has to go in constant cycles of growth and growth and growth. And it always begins with a vision Hearing, understanding, acceptance, submission, the inner working of the Spirit of God resulting in the fruit. One step higher, one step higher, one step higher, and we keep growing. That's how we grow. So here we have an example of a gentleman <clears throat> who actually became an obstacle to himself. Now, I'm going to show you from this story what happened to Zechariah, a priest. When we look at the story, on the surface, it's a very nice, good, cute story. Here we have a priest who's doing his service exactly according to how it's been prescribed by the law of Moses. He is in a certain group of priests that have to come and make their service to the Lord and leave. He's number eight in the list of the teams of priests. And I think he comes in in the ninth week from the Jewish calendar. So he's close to Pentecost. And then he has to stay there for Pentecost. All the priests from all over come. And then he goes, at, goes home. So he's doing his job. He's offering sacrifices. He's doing this incense. Every day he's got to go to the temple and burn offerings. Everything he has to do, he's doing it right. If you look at the picture from the outside, you see a pretty nice, decent situation. You see people are worshiping. You see Zechariah is doing his service. People are doing a good job. Priests are doing a good job. Temple is there. The law is being observed. Nothing wrong. In this story, you don't see anything wrong. People are not doing anything bad. The priests are not doing anything bad. 
But, that's the big but. God says no. God says no. You think it's nice. You think it's satisfactory. You think it's sufficient. I'm saying no. And here's the moral of this story. God is not after something that is relatively good. This situation was relatively good. It seemed that compared to some other times in the history of Israel, this was not a bad time. Nobody was committing any idolatry. Nobody was committing any sins. Everybody was doing their job. The worshipers were worshiping. The priests were doing their job. Everything was relatively good. But God hates relativity. He is not a God of relativity. He doesn't settle for what we think is decent. Oh, this is good enough. You know what? Compared to the other church, we're better. Compared to our older times, we're better. God doesn't measure things based on what we think is decent, relatively good. And here we see a, a very beautiful picture of a relatively good condition, and God rejects it, says, no, I don't like the situation. Because it's not leading to what I am after. You know what he was after? God was after preparing a people that were suitable for the Lord. It says there, to prepare a people suitable for the Lord. And these people, in that relativeness of their activities and having a great time, had missed the point of what God was after. You know, a church can fall into the trap of relativism by thinking, well, this is decent, this is good, everything we're doing, and miss the point of why we're here, for what purpose we've been called to. God has an end in mind, and that ending must be achieved. And if we miss the point, we get distracted by the relative calm, the relative goodness, the relative stability, everything relatively okay, we miss the point. God says, no, 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 that's not what I want. I have a goal in mind, and you have to get to that goal. So Zechariah is in the temple doing his job and people worshiping, and all of a sudden God says, enough is enough. He breaks through the, the barrier of space and time, and he walks into history. He stands there in the person of Gabriel. Zechariah is not even expecting to see the angel. You know why he's not expecting? Because everything seems to be okay. Everything seems to be relatively good. And all of a sudden, Gabriel comes and stands there, and he's shocked. If your life is relatively good, relatively stable, everything is relatively calm, ask yourself a question. Is this how it's supposed to be? Or God has something even better and higher for my life? And that may necessitate for him to step into the history of your life and stand there so you can see him. That is a cycle that is just about to begin. So angel Gabriel comes and he sees the angel. So the first step in the cycle has been fulfilled. He sees. Then the angel opens his mouth and begins to speak. And he does actually here. So that's good too. Step two. Now we go to step three. That's where Zechariah stumbles. That's where Zechariah has a hard time. Says, I can see, I can hear, but I really don't understand what you're trying to say. He has a hard time understanding. And it is precisely at that point where Zechariah actually becomes an obstacle to himself. He becomes a barrier to himself. He stands there, and he doesn't understand. You know why he doesn't understand? Because 
He is used to a routine. Every morning, get up, dress up, go to the temple, burn the incense, do some things, and come back. He's used to the routine. And what the angel speaks, he's talking about something that is not in the natural realm. The angel says, you and your wife will have a son, and you're going to name him John. And he looks at himself, he remembers his wife, he's waiting at home, but she's not a beauty queen anymore. I'm not going to go back to a beauty queen. What is he talking about? (laughs) If he told me, you know what, find a nice chick and maybe you can have another baby, that might be okay. But that woman called Elizabeth, she and I are going to do it and have a baby? That's crazy. That's crazy. You know, when God speaks, it is crazy. It doesn't make sense. Because God never, ever speaks in a place where you can actually find a natural ground to be able to step on it. God never speaks on the natural ground. Somewhere that your logic and your mind can step on it and says, yeah, it does make sense. He doesn't work that way. God never works on the basis of what is natural. He always works on the basis of what is not natural. And it's so hard for us to step into thin air. Because what he speaks is thin air. There is no ground under my feet that I can stand on it and feel it. Reminds me of Indiana Jones in the third episode where he had to go and rescue his father was severely wounded and he had, they were after the, the chalice, the cup that Jesus supposedly had drank the night before he was crucified and supposedly it had these magical powers of eternal life. And then he had to go through all this trouble and finally he gets to the point that the, guide, the book, guidebook says it's right across and he comes out right in, the, in, in a, a cliff and in, inside it is mountain and he walks out and he notices that there is a bottomless, endless pit there. And he can see the other side, but there is no possibility of jumping from this side to the other side. Impossible. Man's logic says you can't do that. He cannot even run and jump. He ha- he's standing there. His father is dying and he's stuck. So he looks through this guidebook that he has and the guidebook says to him, step into the gap and it will happen and he keeps his how could you do that how could you step into something that it doesn't exist you see that uh, huge fall that there is you know there's bottomless you can't even see the the bottom of it but he has to take that step of faith so as soon as he stretches his foot and he puts it into the thin air, knowing that it probably is going to go down, he notices that there is an invisible bridge. He steps on an invisible bridge. He realizes, no, there is a bridge. There is a way. It requires faith. Zechariah shows us a story of a man, just like you and me, who cannot move forward God cannot move forward because we have made itself an obstacle, made ourselves an obstacle to the way God wants to work in our lives. And he just gets stuck there. He ends up doing the routine. He says he served his time and he went home. You see, his faith had become a matter of an occupation, a matter of habit, a matter of routine. So you guys and I, we get up every Sunday morning, we come to church, that's our routine. If I don't go to church, I mean, that's my duty, I gotta go, pastor gets upset. I get a phone call a few days later, where have you been? That's what I call the Zechariah's syndrome, where it had become so routine that there was no more expectation and ability to respond. See, we have to come back to our senses 
And we have to understand that God has a movement that goes from this point to this point, and the result is glorious, and yet we need to be able to not become an obstacle to ourselves. Zechariah became an obstacle to himself. How could that be? I'm an old person. My wife is not only old, she's also barren. She's got double problems. At least Sarah was fertile, even old. But this woman is not only old, but she's infertile. She can't even have it. We tried so many times in the past when she was younger and beautiful. But now look at her. It's not going to happen. He had no place to step and have confidence. You see, we like to have confidence when we want to do something. We've got to feel secure before we take a step. That's our human nature. That's how we've been taught. Zechariah had been taught all his life that infertile women cannot have babies all of a sudden. Old people cannot have babies. That's the law of nature. Nature says you can't do that. Nature is opposed to an old person having a baby. But God says, hey, I created the nature. If I want to make an exception this time, who are you to ask me? It's not going to happen. But you know what? That also resulted in pride. Zechariah, because when you don't step into the realm of faith, when you don't understand and thus you don't accept what God wants to tell you, the alternative is pride. Because now you begin to depend on what you have and you hold on to it and you say, no, 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 no. We've been doing like this for 2,000 years. Our race, our culture, our people are like this. I talk to people who come from Christian cultures from the past. And, oh, no, no, our church is not this way. We, we don't do it this way. You take pride in something that is of the past. You have absolutely no experience of what is ahead. It's always looking to the back looking to the past to take pride in what you've had in the past. Nothing forward-looking because you're stuck. You're not te- taking a step to stand on what has been spoken to you. If you already had a, me- a visit with the Lord and you heard, but you need to understand and to accept. Zechariah didn't do that. So pride had taken in. And when pride comes in, that's it. You're fallen. You're not going to respond anymore because you're full of your preconceived ideas of what it's supposed to be. Well, God is going to move on. God is not going to wait for you and for me. God is not going to wait for Zacharias. God has a plan that he has to go from point A to point Z. He's not going to wait for you. He made an offer to you. He said, come along. I want to take you. To, you know, you're going to be so happy being here. And you say, no, 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 no. Along the way, I've got to jump this gap, and I can't do that. And God says, okay. So you don't want to trust me. That's fine. You get stuck here, but I'm going to move on. So he moves on, and the, the pride shows. You know how the pride shows? The angel says, I am Gabriel that stands before God. Like, I mean, come on. Fix your perspective. Who are you talking to? You're arguing with the angel of God. A mere mortal argues and questions the angel that speaks for God. That takes a lot of pride. That takes a lot of guts. That you actually argue with the angel over something that you shouldn't be. Now, remember I talked to you about the other pregnancy. It was precisely the same experience. God appeared through, Gabriel comes to Mary. Mary is a young girl. She's also shocked. But he tells, he sees the angel. She sees the angel. She hears the angel and the angel speaks to her. And what is the response from Mary? She understands. And what does she do? She says, may it be done to me according to your word. Mary is different from Zechariah. Mary immediately responds by saying, I don't know how it's going to be. I don't know how a virgin girl can become pregnant. It doesn't make sense in my head. 
It's beyond my ability to understand. And yet, you know what, God? If you say, I'm okay with it. And she humbles herself and says, may it be done to me according to your word. What a prayer. What a response to God versus what a response from Zechariah. Zechariah says, how could this be? What does he say when the angel announces to him? I love the way he talks about it. He says, the angel said, your prayers have been answered. You're going to have a, to Zechariah, and he he responds by saying, uh, Zechariah said to the angel, verse 18, how shall I know this for certain? You see, he he did not even ask the angel, okay, well, I don't understand. Can you tell me? Because Mary asked that question, says, how could this be? It was a legitimate question. Angel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The Lord will cast his countenance on you, and you will be pregnant. So he did explain in response to an honest question. When you have an honest question, God answers. But here, Zechariah is not asking an honest question. He says, how will I know for sure? Prove it. When I go home, I like to see my wife change to a nice chick. That I will know. Uh, I will know. If my wife is transformed into a nice 25-year-old woman, I'm in for it. I'm going to go for it. But if I go home and I see this old lady with all the wrinkles, come on. How can I be certain I'm going to waste all my energy trying to have all this sex for all these days and nothing is going to happen? I'm not going to do that. It's too much. doesn't make sense. Mary says, how is this going to be? The angel says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. You will be pregnant. I accept it. May it be done to me according to your word. Have you ever had an experience with God when God is trying to tell you something, reveal something to you, and you don't understand, but you say, may it be done to me according to your word? Instead of saying, how will I know this for sure? How will I be certain? That comes from pride. Because his racial pride... His religious pride did not allow him to accept what was being said. God wants to show us many more things, and yet if we say, well, how would I know for sure? You know what? So many people have asked us this question in the past. Instead of asking, Pastor Fred, I don't understand about this particular teaching. Can you explain more? They ask, well, how would I know this is true? Prove it. Show me the scriptures. Show me the, where this word is used. Ah, that's a Zechariah's syndrome. Pride. Our denomination knows it this way. Our church knows it this way. How could I be sure that you, what you guys are saying is true? Well, the angel says, you know what? <clears throat> I'm not going to argue. I'm going to move on. I'm just going to go where I have to go and do what I have to do. It's interesting that God never gives up on us. He goes home after doing his routine. He finishes his time, his regular routine religious activities. He goes home. He misses his wife. He doesn't find that 25-year-old, but he misses his wife. He goes there and says, wife, you know what? Let's have fun tonight. He doesn't know that it's, this, not an, this is not an ordinary fun. It looks like that way, but there's going to be a seed conceived. Who's going to do the conception? <laughs> Zacharias didn't do any conception. Elizabeth didn't do any conception because it couldn't happen. What they did, they thought that they had the regular marital relationship, but that night when he went back home, God was waiting to do something that was not natural. Actually, I told Zechariah that what I'm going to do is not going to be natural because earlier on he said you're going to name him John. 
The name John means the favor of God, the gift of God. In other words, what I do is a gift. What I do is my favor. It's not going to be because you too did something. It is because I favored you. I gifted to you someone. It's God's grace that does that. It's His grace that brings a conception of what the Lord wants in our hearts. But during the time that you are still waiting to see the result of this, you're not going to be able to speak. No testimony. No testimony. A priest is supposed to be able to speak. A priest is supposed to instruct people. A priest is supposed to teach people. They're the teachers also. No more testimony. You know that if believers and if people who are in a position of service if they have seen God, heard God, but not have understood or accepted and surrender, their spiritual mouth is closed. Their tongue is dumbed. They may speak and preach and teach, but what comes out of there is not the testimony that God has in mind. We have two types of preachers. Preachers who preach out of their own abundance of theological knowledge, and education, and what they have been taught, or people who when they speak, heaven is open, and the tongue is in the control of the Holy Spirit, and that's where Zechariah got shut down. You're not going to speak anymore, because you cannot believe what I am supposed to do. You will lose your testimony if God speaks, and you do not understand, and accept, and surrender to that Speaking, you may speak a lot, but you really don't have that testimony that God is looking for. And Zechariah, for the entire duration of nine months, from the time that, actually more than nine months, a little bit more, almost ten months, Zechariah could not speak. He was dumb. His mouth could not say anything because he had opposed what the angel of the Lord had spoken and he had not believed and stepped out in faith to stand on what God was saying. He could not understand. He could not accept. He could not surrender. And therefore God says, now that is the case, stay silent for a while under my discipline. So Zechariah remained silent for 10 months. Didn't say a word. That's how God disciplines us sometimes when we cannot step into the realm of faith and stand where what God has said, God says you will have no more testimony. What? You want to just keep talking? Talk about what? When you haven't been able to even believe what I have said. When God says something and we cannot believe, we don't exercise our God-given gift of faith and stand on what God says in spite of what we feel or think how hard or how easy or how possible or impossible it is, God says, you're not going to be my testimony. You're not going to be my witness. Don't speak. You can speak for men. You can speak for organizations. You can speak for your church. You can, you're not going to speak for me. We have so many preachers that speak for some other entity and not is not the voice of God. It sounds familiar. The vocabulary is the same. But it is not what God is speaking because they have not understood and accepted what God has said. So God comes through, and when they want to name the child, everyone says you have to name it after the father. Call him Zacharias. Elizabeth runs and says, no, 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 no. His name is going to be John. It is the favor of God. It is the gift of God. It is the grace of God. We couldn't do anything. This child is not the result of Zechariah and myself having the ability to conceive anything. It was a conception by God permitting the conception. And that's why the word of God says he would be filled with the Holy Spirit even from the womb of his mother. And he would prepare the way of the Lord. See, John became an instrument for God to finally get to the last point 
the goal of God's mind, which was the appearance of the Son. You see, you and I are in the cycle of seeing and hearing and understanding and accepting and surrendering the deep work of the Spirit to be prepared as a people for the coming of the Lord Jesus. That is in our growth right now. The Lord is about to appear. God is preparing people that are, that's what he said to Zechariah. Uh, in verse 17, as to make ready a pre people prepared for the Lord. God wants to raise John. <clears throat> John is raised in our womb. In this church, God is raising John. His grace, his favor, and his instrument, because John became the instrument that prepared people for the appearing of the Lord. That's what John is. That's who John is. Actually, it's interesting. I'll, I'll end with this. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 6, <clears throat> in order to make sure that we understand that John was totally, 100% a gift of God and a favor of God, there was no human instrumentality other than Zechariah and Elizabeth not even knowing, not even planning, not even being able to conceive this child, which was given by the power of the Holy Spirit in John chapter 1, verse 6. It says, there came a man sent from God, whose name was John. He was sent from God. Favor of God. The grace of God. The gift of God to prepare the people, the hearts of the people for the appearance of the Lord. What God is doing here is bringing us to a point we're just about to go to a conference. Well, what is going to happen in this conference? Other than we being able to see, to hear, to understand, to accept, to surrender, so that that work can be done in us. And the result of that work, had Zechariah allowed the Holy Spirit from that first moment, would have been a birth of John with a testimony. It became a birth of John without a testimony. God still accomplished his end, but Zechariah missed the opportunity to testify of what the favor and the grace of God was. Do we want to be believers in a church that God will still accomplish his end without a testimony? Or we want to be the testimony along the way as God does everything in our lives individually and corporately, John is still going to come, whether it's you and me in it or not. John will appear. John will be given birth. The question is, along the way, I, I, am I dumb? Or my mouth is open to testify of the great work of the Lord Jesus. Amen, Amen Pastor.